Captain Tachyon, Croy, Prince, and Jack of Brawn, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, welcome to the card table. So, Suicide Kings. I did some videos recently talking about sort of the idiosyncrasies of each book in these in these three or four book cycles, and how the middle book of these cycles, in particular, have some some unusual quirks just structurally that are kind of interesting to sort of think about and look at. The concluding books in the triads, uh, book 20, Suicide Kings, is the conclusion of the committee triad. The concluding books are, are, are generally pretty straightforward. They're the braided narratives. They read just like a novel, even though they are multiple authors. So you're looking at volume three, volume six, volume seven, volume 11, volume 15. This one, and so yeah, like always, it's it's you're, you're cross-cutting amongst, from amongst, you know, any, anywhere, anywhere from five to eight characters. In this one, I believe it is six. Again, any time you cut to a new character, you're also cutting to a different author. So this time it's Rust Belt, written by Ian Tregillis, uh, The Gardener, written by Stephen Lee, Noel Matthews, written by Melinda Snodgrass, Bubbles, written by Caroline Spector, and there's Jonathan Hive, written by Daniel Abraham. Is that six? I think that's six. Gardner, Rust Belt, Noel Matthews, Jonathan Hive, Bubbles. Oh, yeah. And the Radical, a.k.a. Tom Weathers, who's, t uh, well, that's an alias. He's the Radical, and he's also Mark Meadows. Written by my man, Vic Milan. How could I leave out my favorite guy? So, like I, I mentioned last time, the, the previous book, there was this whole thing of sort of giving us a sense of just the, the chaos of, of this committee organization where they're constantly being sending teams or, or representatives, ace representatives, to these different locations around the globe to deal with different crises. Volume 20 kind of zeroes in on um, this growing problem with this uh, people's paradise, this country in Africa ruled by the Mashambos, who, whose will is enforced by uh, this powerful, powerful ace that everyone knows as Tom Weathers, but we longtime Wild Cards readers know as the radical. So a big part of the storyline in Suicide Kings involves um, the, the use by this by the people's paradise of, of child soldiers. This initiative taken on the part of, of the rulers of the people's paradise to just sort of seize children from different villages and expose them deliberately to the wildcard virus, which still, after all this time, it's still the same statistics where 90 out of every 100 people exposed to the wildcard virus die, and of those remaining 10, nine of them become jokers and one becomes an ace. So that's still the case. So it's essentially a mass genocide because they're exposing huge quantities of children to a virus with a with a 90% fatality rate. The, the children that become aces are, are then pressed, pressed ganged into, into becoming young soldiers, essentially. And, and that's how some of the characters get involved. So like Rust Belt has been corresponding, has, has taken taken on the sponsorship of, of, of an African child. And there's one of several African children, I believe, and, and there's one that he feels like a special connection with, you know, with having become, you know, pen pals with these kids. And this one kid stops corresponding with him and he's worried that something has happened to him. And he's correct this, that this child is actually one of the children who's been kidnapped for this experimentation with the wild card virus. And so uh, Rust Belt wants to go to Africa to, to do something about that, to go to the People's Paradise. He convinces another member of the committee named the Gardener to, who's a Stephen Lee character, to go with him. One of the children um, exposed to the virus is this young girl named uh, Adesina, who was exposed to the virus, caused her to, to sort of form a cocoon around herself, and, and the scientists assumed she was a, a joker who turned into a rock and died or something like that, but actually she was sort of in this metamorphic cocoon and also developed telepathic abilities, and so she makes telepathic contact with uh, Bubbles, which prompts Bubbles to also want to go to Africa to uh, to to rescue a child. So Jonathan Hive, I, I talked a little bit about him in, in Volume 18. I think I just said that I liked him. I don't know that I actually went into much detail, but he's a, an aspiring journalist whose uh, ace ability is that he can sort of, his body can transform into a swarm of uh, hornets, which is pretty cool. His thread in Suicide Kings is kind of interesting because it's really more about him having to call upon his his sort of neophyte level skills as a journalist because he's been assigned by the committee to, to figure out who Tom Weathers is, who is the radical, where did he come from. It sort of acts as a kind of uh, expositional device for, for maybe people who are new to the to the franchise, who maybe started with the tour relaunch and aren't, f aren't familiar with everything that happened with Mark Meadows over the course of the previous you know, the, all the books leading up to the committee triad. Captain Tripp's story kind of unfolds over 10 of, of the 20 books that we're up to so far. So volume 1, volume 2, 8, 9, 10, 
12, 14 and 15, and then 19, and now 20. At that point, when, when Suicide Kings came out, not all of those early books were in print yet, so I guess this was a way a way to kind of catch people up so they wouldn't have to read all the old books. Daniel Abraham was a, was a, was a great choice for that arc because he manages to do it in a way that it's essentially following Jonathan Hive as he learns a bunch of things that we as readers, we longtime readers already know. But he, he does it in a very entertaining way, and Jonathan Hive is just such a fun character to read about that it's actually still kind of cool. What you end up getting in practice is Jonathan Hive constantly giving commentary on what he's learning about about the biography of Mark Meadows and making some very kind of snide comments sometimes or sort of very sort of snarky summaries of, of certain of certain aspects of Mark Meadows biography and Vic Milan the creator of Mark Meadows who wrote all those stories uh, I remember him on Facebook talking about how much he loved Daniel Abraham's the way he phrased it and, and offering these even though they were even though they were kind of snarky and sarcastic takes Vic Milan found them very accurate and very amusing and that sort of did my heart good it was kind of fun to see Milan say you know praising another writer another writer's uh take on his character Melinda Snodgrass's character is kind of on his own track uh, still still tied in with with uh with the radical and aka Tom Weathers, but his agenda is a little different where he's attempting to, he, he has a plan. These characters, the, the Shambos, I can't remember their first names, but they're this husband and wife who rule this country, the people's paradise, are instituting all these horrible policies, human rights violations, but because they're, they're backed by the power of, of the radical, it seems like nothing can really be done. And so uh, Noel Matthews sort of engages in this kind of elaborate plot that essentially becomes a, sort of a little heist movie within the book where Noel Matthews has to recruit these operatives for a, for a heist because they want to do this whole um, robbing, the, robbing the treasury of the, of, of the, of the people's paradise and, and but pinning the robbery on the right peoples in order to break up this alliance between the radical and the Nishambos. and Just a cool, fun, fun arc. And then Vic Milan writes the radical himself, who, who at this point is kind of... He's the radical all the time, having submerged the Mark Meadows persona for years, but Mark Meadows starts to emerge. So sometimes Milan is writing the radical, and sometimes he's writing uh, Mark Meadows, uh, who, as we all know, is my favorite. So no, no need for much commentary there. Of course, I'm going to like that stuff. As always, with the, with, the, with the concluding books and these wildcard triads, you know, some nice, nice use of logistics to get, to get these characters all coming together in a, in a very climactic and exciting way at the end of the book. Uh, in a way that really feels cathartic and it all works pretty well. I would say with this one, I, I have never noticed this to be a problem in the previous mosaics. And so it's one of those things where the first time you see it, maybe not done so well, it gives you some appreciation for all the times they avoided this pitfall. So uh, in all the previous mosaic novels, the braided narratives, uh, this has never been an issue. But I think in this book, it kind of is, which is that Bubble's agenda is to go to the pe people's paradise to rescue a, a a child in Africa and Rust Belt's agenda is to go to the people's paradise because he wants to rescue a kid in Africa and the gardener's agenda in this book is to go to the people's paradise to rescue some some kids in Africa you know and the gardener and Rust Belt originally are a pair so they're working together they join forces at first and then they split forces and so so you are cross-cutting between three characters all who have just a very similar agenda you know even though there are details that and shadings that make each one you know, distinct from each other, but I would say maybe not. I would say not distinct enough. I would say that's a that's that's a flaw in this book. That um, when you're cross cutting between six characters in the in the previous wild card braided narratives, I think they always did a good job of of if you figure like every book has five to seven different character arcs, they can't all be the same shape. The most obvious one is just to to start you know calm and just build straight up towards the climax. You know, or you can do that kind of like the stepped stepped approach. But ultimately, you know, every novel or, or every good story, you know, it's it's really it's it's never quite that you know simple. There's there's peaks and there's valleys and there's there's peaks of ag action and excitement and there's lulls and of all the of all the myriad works of fiction that exist in, in so many different media and genres, what makes them all distinct from each other, or one of the things that makes them distinct. Uh, is that those peaks and valleys are in different places. Previous wildcards braided narratives, I feel like, for example, Black Trump, which I raved about not long ago, you've got your five characters, Jay Aykroyd, Mark Meadows, uh, Zoe, Carnifex, and Hartman. If you were to take each individual uh, thread, those five characters over the course of Black Trump, and, and map them in terms of peaks and valleys, no two of them would really quite match up perfectly. They'd all, they'd all have, you know, one character would be at a valley when another would be at a peak. 
um, and one character would be in, in an action sequence while another character is just maybe just having some little heart-to-heart conversation in a hotel room. So that as you cross-cut, you're really getting a sense of not just cutting from one character to another, but from another from one very distinct arc to another. And there are phases in Suicide Kings where it does feel like Rust Belt's just kind of trudging through some foliage in Africa. Let's cut to the gardener. Uh, What is she doing? Well, she's trudging through some foliage in Africa. Let's cut to Bubbles. What is she doing? Trudging through some foliage in Africa. That element of this one, I think that could have been done better. And, And it's something that this is the first time I've noticed that in one of the braided narratives. Not to be overly critical. I think Ian Tregillis... Uh, he's he's a favorite of mine, and um, I, I think he his story with Rust Belt um, and this one of the child soldiers uh, this is this ace who's called Ghost, uh, seemingly psychotic child. But the, there's this sense of you know how much of that is just due to the conditioning, and you know it, is there is there still a, a redeemable human being you know in this in what seems to be just this sort of like creepy child killer. The dynamic that evolves as he's kind of trudging through the jungle being stalked by this insubstantial little girl ghost who's trying to kill him ends up being, you know, at first creepy, but then also there are moments that are kind of funny. Then there are moments that are very sweet and uh, very heartfelt. And uh, it's just really nicely shaped. If, 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 if you were looking at, if you wanted to look at the three those three very similar quests I think uh, the Rust Belt one is probably the most successful Snodgrass's heist I say heist movie because I feel like that's the most common I'm sure there are heist books and whatever heists comics but I feel like in film is is where that genre really comes to life that's sort of like assembling the team and working out the plan and the logistics and you're going to do this and you're you're our expert in, in X and you're our expert in Y and we need to all team up and for this perfectly executed plan. So it's like, it's a heist movie in prose, and I think it's just that's just so different from the other plot lines that it really gives the book that extra texture that it needs. Meanwhile, I think Vic Milan, he's writing the villain of the piece because the radical has evolved to the point where he's now the big bad and he's the villain. Vic Milan is definitely in his intense, violent action-adventure mode, so sometimes you're cutting away from those trudges through the jungle to a moment when the radical is maybe just wiping out a bunch of soldiers and blowing up tanks and... Again, it's you need those kind of moments, those moments of intensity. This book is really possibly the the ending of the Mark Meadows arc that was begun all the way back in Volume 1. I could be wrong. I mean, Vic Milan has tragically passed away since then, but it's possible that other writers will continue to have more, more interesting things befall the character. But it seems like when you get to the end of Volume 20, it cert- certainly feels like, okay, this is the, sort of the end of the road for Mark Meadows. This is the the end of his arc. Very satisfying for me since, of course, as I've said, that's my favorite character. So uh, very cool to see his his storyline finally come to a resolution in this book. I'd say Ian Tregillis' Rust Belt arc is is probably the runner-up. I think that's the most most moving uh, in the way that it develops and evolves and, and ends. This is sort of another broken record point, maybe, because I, I do say this with all the braided narratives, but um, they do, once again, do a good job of, at the end, you know, they get these in this case six characters all in the same room at the end or, um, or figuratively speaking you know all, all in the same place for the for the big climax at the end and find a way to sort of logistically have each each character play an important role in that in that final climax and uh, this one definitely has a particularly rousing climax oh I should also give a shout out so Vic Milan as much as I like him he's got his quirks as a writer and there there definitely is a, a sense maybe not the most feminist friendly writer his characters are male and we're seeing things from their point of view and so maybe it it makes sense that you know that these male characters would would not necessarily always have the most enlightened view of women milan's characters seem particularly a little outdated in their in their in their in the ways they think about the the opposite sex i don't think any of it's meant intentionally or or meant in any way to uh to be anti-feminist i do feel like maybe sometimes unintentionally though it's it's certainly uh goes against the goes against the feminist grain sometimes um you know a lot a lot of infantilized female characters i mean uh, certainly mark meadow's daughter sprout fits into that category even though it's couched as this you know medical condition but um but then uh you know some some hypersexualized females and some fetishized females and stuff and obviously i've talked about how much i love milan's work and but i'm certainly not blind to these elements can be problematic and and somewhere in there there's also a kind of 
reveling in certain uh, male attitudes. In some ways, you could argue that that's epitomized in this in this character called Monster, this 30-foot-tall, what's the word for monsters like King Kong and Godzilla? I'll look it up and I'll flash it out on the screen. Is it ka- Kaiju? Kaiju? Uh, this giant character called Monster. You know, that typical giant monster trope, but with a twist that you might not see in a Godzilla movie or in a King Kong movie, where the, the narrative focuses on the large naked male genitalia of this creature. Certainly you could argue that there's, it feels a little like a little bit of literary uh, exhibitionism, a little bit of literary indecent exposure. And the monster had a gigantic heart on. So Caroline Spector, whose character Bubbles is, is, is meant to be, I think very, very much an antidote to some of, some of the, the, the more sexist tropes and wild cards, you know, a very empowered character who's meant to sort of defy some of the stereotypes or, you know, or at least sort of throw some of those stereotypes back in back in the reader's face and sort of confront them. So there's a point in this book when Bubbles, uh, sort of at the end, one of the big climactic moments when Bubbles kind of comes, figuratively speaking, she comes face to face with Monster and his very large uh, tumescence. I think that moment is very well well constructed where, where she sort of almost goes a little meta the, f- the first appearance of Bubbles, the, the title of her story is Metagames, and it feels like a, a little bit of meta-commentary of, of Spectre maybe kind of talking to Milan and saying, because Bubbles kind of looks at it and says, oh, come on, come on, <laughs> seriously. And Milan strikes me as the kind of person who actually would have quite enjoyed being sort of called on it, taken to task for how ridiculous it, again, how, how sort of exhibitionist it is in a way. It's the sort of thing that feels the energy of that moment only works be- because of this multiple author setup. It's the kind of thing that you could only strike this tone with different authors all contributing because you can have an author like Milan reveling in the ridiculousness of this of this giant naked monster sort of uh, just kind of letting his freak flag fly as it were or letting his uh, his freak phallus fly I guess and then having another author who's just kind of maybe having none of it <laughs> using her character to say come on this is ridiculous this is seriously what you're confronting me with right now get out of here with this you know obviously you could have one writer you know writing writing both characters and but there's there's like the lack of a straw man I, I think is what what, what 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 I like about it because Vic Milan created this character because he thought it would be cool you know and bubbles is is is, is being used I think to some degree as, as Caroline Specter's mouthpiece uh, to really look at it from the other direction and say this is not cool it's silly there isn't a straw man it isn't like one it isn't one author creating something ridiculous just to have the other character show up to to mock it and you know in this case one writer saw something that could be taken down a peg in in the, in the work of another author and uh, and we can just kind of see it play out in this kind of meta way on the page so that moment has always kind of struck stayed with me as something I enjoy. That also, I guess that kind of speaks to what I was saying before about Jonathan Hive, again, gets to make a lot of snarky comments about the sort of Mark Meadows journey as it as it has unfolded over the course of books one through 19. Thanks to the, the wonders of the modern world and social media, being able to actually see Vic Milan go online and say, uh, wasn't that great the way Daniel Abraham kind of, <laughs> kind of made fun of the radical? It's just kind of neat. So very cool way to sort of end the story of Mark Meadows slash the radical slash all the other friends you know slash monster bringing that all that stuff to a very satisfying conclusion and definitely a cool book i've logged my criticisms but i I definitely don't want that to to detract from the fact that i still think this is a a strong entry not as strong as uh, inside straight but well worth your time i think so next time we'll move on to book one of the next triad fort freak uh, which is a favorite so i'm looking forward to that so see you then to try and give our love back some sparks. He said, we'll get your love growing. But before we get going, may I highly recommend Cod Shocks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction. Cause my baby's hooked on shared world fiction.